know the story of the Hofstetter Lectures. The Robert Hofstetter Memorial Lectures were established 30 years ago, 1993 was the first time, uh, by the Stanford Physics Department, and they highlight uh, the, the broad areas of both fundamental and applied physics uh, that were pursued by our late colleague Bob Hofstetter in his career. And I'm also very pleased that, that some of his family are, have even, even joined us at the club there, uh, uh, Doug and Laura Hofstetter. And uh, it, this is a sort of a, a, a tribute to the enduring uh, power of this lecture series that um, we're, we're uh, able to uh, really honor different people every year for the same kinds of, of, of physics. So we invite an eminent speaker every year. Uh, and there are two lectures in the series. Uh, this one, which is a physics colloquium type lecture, and then there's an evening lecture where the general uh, public is invited, and you're definitely all invited to come back for that, and that will be uh, tomorrow evening, and it will uh, take place right next door in the other lecture hall here at Hewlett. So it's my, my great privilege and honor to introduce the speaker this year, this one, the 2023 Hofstadter Lecturer. Uh, it's Dame Susan Jocelyn Bell Burnell. Um, Professor Bell Burnell has a number of titles and affiliations that I should uh, tell you about by way of introduction, although I certainly won't attempt to be comprehensive. Uh, first, I should say something about this title, Dame, which is not very mm. common uh, for those of us attending colloquia here in the U.S. It means uh, something else. <laughs> yeah, it means something else, right. Uh, and she is Dame Commander in the Order of the British Empire, which is a, a high honor in, uh, in Britain. Uh, she's also a fellow of the Royal Society of London, a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, uh, fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, and I'm proud to say also an international member of the National Academy of Sciences here in the U.S. Uh, she's the Chancellor of the University of Dundee in Scotland and also holds an appointment at Oxford University. And, and you can see what it, all that boils down to is she hangs out at Oxford. And, and so that, that's what's listed up in the slide behind me. Now let me just tell you a little bit about her background. Uh, she received her undergraduate degree from Glasgow and her PhD from Cambridge, and she is most famous out there in the world as the discoverer of the first radial pulsars in 1967 while she was a graduate student uh, at Cambridge University. And, and uh, throughout her career that she's continued to be interested in radio, but also gamma ray, x-ray, infrared, and millimeter wave astronomy. Um, in more recent years, uh, she's also held some important leadership positions, and I should tell you about. She was president of the Royal Astronomical Society, and she has been president of the Institute of Physics. And she's also received a number of prizes, and I'll just cite a couple here. In 2018, she was awarded the Special Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics. And what's really wonderful about this is that she donated the three million dollars or so in prize money to the Institute of Physics to establish a fund to help female, minority, and refugee students to become research physicists. Her most recent honor that I could find anyway is the 2020, of course, it's the Hofstetter Lectureship, but before that, <laughs> is, is, the, is the 2021 Copley Medal, which, the Copley Medal is interesting, it's the, it's the most prestigious scientific award in the UK. It's awarded to an outstanding scientist in any field of science, one per year, and it's been going on annually since 1731. Uh, and there's a little bit of an asterisk on that, because, in fact, Jocelyn is the most recent individual to receive the copy medal, because last year, 2022, for the very first time in its history, yeah. I think, yeah. it was not awarded to an individual, but rather to a team. Uh, for the development of the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine. Mm. Um, so, uh, as I pointed out, uh, Dr. Bell Brunel will also be back here tomorrow evening at staff lectures at 7.30. And the title of that lecture will be entitled Tick, 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 Little Star, How We Wonder What You Are. So I invite you to also come to that. Uh, also, a number of you uh, have signed up to come to the Hofstadter dinner, which will follow this 
colloquium, and uh, the, the reception for that will start at 6 p.m. Um, in, in the faculty club. Now today, as you can see, she's going to deliver a colloquium on the topic Women in Astrophysics. And so I've taken up way too much of her time. So let me turn the floor over. Please help, uh, help me welcome Dame Jocelyn Dalbergan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here. It's actually my first visit to, Stan to Stanford. Nearly said Stansted, of course, which is an airport in Britain. Um, <laughs> so great pleasure to be here. So thank you very much. And thank you for coming along this afternoon. I am always been rather in a minority in astrophysics in Britain. Uh, probably the same thing is still true in the, UK, in the USA. And I have taken an interest in the position of women. I'm going to tell you a little bit about three, four women astronomers. You'll have heard of several of them, but maybe not all of them. A little bit about their history and what they've done. And then move on to review the position of women in astrophysics and how it has evolved in recent years, using particularly data from the International Astronomical Union. So my home in Britain is near a city called Bath, rather an ancient city, and it was in that city that William Herschel first started his life in Britain. He was German, he moved to Britain to be an organist and a conductor. He came of a family of military musicians in Hamburg, and he intended to pursue a career in music. Uh, he asked if his sister Caroline could come along as well, basically to be his housekeeper. She had a nice singing voice and so she might be a musical asset as well. She was currently working for one of the other brothers and he required William to pay for a housekeeper before he would release Caroline to come with William. So that's sort of how women were regarded in those days. You know, they, they kept house for their fathers, brothers, and so on. So Caroline came to Bath, to Britain, to this tiny house. Um, you can see, I think it's a motorcycle with a grey cover over it. Behind it is the front door. Um, the window next to the front door, that is the extent of the width of the house. And it's several stories high. And it can't be very deep or there'd be no light in the middle of the house. So it really was very, very tiny. Uh, it's now a museum. The family lived there for about 10 years, but it's now the Herschel Museum. And although William was a musician at the time he came, and Caroline was recruited to be his housekeeper, but also to sing, um, William fairly soon became interested in astronomy and was making his own mirrors. So in Caroline's diary, she's complaining that several of the major rooms have a fairly large mirror being ground in it, and that his cravats, his lace cravats, are spattered with pitch, which must have been difficult to get out, I will admit. So William became increasingly interested in astronomy and much less interested in music, almost from the time Caroline arrived. And they evolved quite a good observing system. You know that you need to be dark adapted if you're looking through a telescope. William would be at the telescope and Caroline would be maybe as far away as that door is from me. And William would yell when a star transited. Caroline had a desk, a little light and a clock. And she noted the time of the transit, the point at which William yelled. And that's the way they observed and they produced a lot of catalogues of stars. It was also here that Herschel discovered the planet Uranus, Uranus, I'm not sure what way is the accepted pronunciation in this country, and there is a plaque in the back garden, which you can see on the right-hand side. Uh, you may not be able to read it. Here lived scientist and musician Sir William Herschel, 
1738-1822, from where he found the planet Uranus, March the 13th, 1781. He also discovered infrared radiation in 1800. And his sister, Caroline Herschel, early woman scientist, 1750 to 1848, look how long she lived, hunter of comets. And the picture on the left basically shows you the back of the house. Uh, there is now behind the house a supermarket car park. And some of the uh, amateur astronomers in Bath decided to see, could they still see that planet in spite of the supermarket car park and its lights? And they had an interesting technique. There were two of them. Um, the scientist leading the project had Herschel's old telescope. His colleague had a powerful pair of binoculars and a laser pointer, like, you know, we use in lectures. And with the binoculars, he could find Uranus, and he pointed the laser pointer in the right direction, and knowing where to point, with Herschel's telescope, in spite of the car park, you could find that planet. So I thought it was a beat, neat bit of uh, adaption of modern technology. Now, they got more and more into astronomy. I think I mentioned they came from Hanover. We had some Hanoverian kings, George I, II, III. We'll have another George one day, fairly soon, I think. Um, but anyway, one of the Hanoverian Georges was king of England and lived uh, at Windsor, largely, and wanted William Herschel to come and be the sort of court astronomer. So the Herschels moved to Slough, which is quite close to Windsor, moved all their telescopes and everything and continued their observing. But when the king had some visitors he didn't quite know what to do with, you'll recognise the situation I expect, he'd bundle them into a coach and they'd drive round to the Herschels' place to be shown the telescopes. And if William was away, Caroline did the honours and it was clear she knew exactly what was what and how it worked. And their address book, visitor's book, reads like a who's who. Ultimately, Caroline herself was given a small salary for her work. So I think she became the first female civil servant in Britain. There was a long gap before the next one, I can tell you. When William was away, Caroline used a little telescope that he'd given her, and she swept the sky for comets and she found several comets, discovered them. Uh, you probably don't need telling what comets are. Um, I particularly like the right-hand slide. You can maybe just see the comet uh, dust tail going up more vertically than the visible tail. And because of the red light that the astronomers are using with their telescopes and cameras, you can see one or two people in the foreground, which you don't often get in an astronomical photograph. So Caroline lived to the age of 98 or something like that and after the age of 90 collected three or four major awards, recognitions. Um, it was lucky she lived as long as she did. But uh. <laughs> Cecilia Payne-Guposchkin you probably know rather more about. She started in Britain near Oxford her father had been an Oxford Don, had to resign his university post in order to marry, because Oxford was a bit monastic back in those days. Not that long ago, in fact. Um, so her father was quite old when she was born, and he died while she was still quite a young girl. Uh, she had quite a lot of her education in that part of England, and some of it was quite good and she had an aunt who was a botanist. She was clearly very bright and family hoped she would go to university and she said, right, I'll go to Cambridge and I'll read botany. She got a place in Cambridge, Cam sorry, Cambridge, England, I'm talking about. She got a place in Newnham College, Cambridge, which was the woman's college at that time. There weren't many women round the place. Um, 
and started her botany degree. But at the end of the first term of her first year, there was a big lecture, great competition for tickets. Friend of hers got a ticket, she didn't. But friend in the end couldn't go and gave the ticket to her. So she went to this lecture. It was by Arthur Stanley Eddington reporting the Eclipse exhibition, exhibition, expedition to Principe to study the eclipse of the sun, measure the bending of light by the mass of the sun. Uh, she had no intention of doing physics or maths or anything like that, but she was absolutely transfixed, her word, by the lecture, the lecturer and found that when she got back to her room in Newnham, she could write the lecture out word for word. Uh, she decided she was done with botany and she was going to do physics and astronomy. So she, sw she switched. Um, she got to know Eddington. I think she did a bit of research with him in later years and uh, decided she would actually be an astronomer, an astrophysicist. Eddington advised her to go to the United States. He said Britain was not a suitable place for a female to be an astronomer. And so, as you probably know, she went to Harvard and did this thesis that seemed to say that stars were largely made of hydrogen, which wasn't what people expected at that time. They thought the Earth and the Sun had similar composition. And she came under quite a lot of pressure to modify her thesis. She did put in a phrase about the sun appears to be largely made of hydrogen, but that's probably not correct. But that was as far as she went. She stayed on at Harvard in various miscellaneous positions. She married a Russian emig emigre, Sergei Gaposhkin, which is how she ended up with this complica complicated name. Um, and ultimately became head of department, chair of department. But until she became chair of department, her office was literally a broom cupboard. You know, you opened the door, there's the shelf, you sort of sat in the doorway and did your work. Um, it was partly to do with the relationship between Harvard and Radcliffe College where the women were, but I think it was partly laziness on the parts of some heads of department. The next woman I want to talk about is Vera Rubin, whom some of you I'm sure will know maybe even better than I knew. She was studying the rotation of galaxies, how the rotation speed changes with distance. And she came up with some rather controversial results. So in sketch form, a plot of velocity against distance out from the center of the galaxy might go initially as the solid line goes, but then when you reach the edge of the galaxy, it should drop off as a one over r cubed, Kepler's laws basically, and that's the dashed line. Vera couldn't find the dashed line. Her data kept following the solid line. And a lot of people had a lot of trouble with that piece of data. And she came under a hell of a lot of pressure to reobserve and reobserve and reobserve and show that her original solid line was wrong. So she reobserved re and got the same thing again, did some more galaxies, got the same things again, did some more galaxies, got the same things again. And it's because of the existence of dark matter, which forms an extensive halo around a galaxy, but isn't visible. So you don't find it directly. You get hints of it from the way the rot rotation curve fails to drop. Um, I was in Princeton at that time, and she came to lecture, and people were polite, but that was about as far as it went. <laughs> anyway, we now know that she was right, that there is large amount of dark matter associated with galaxies, and that's what's influencing the rotation curve. 
Uh, I think she only did it for spiral galaxies, as far as I can remember, but I'm not absolutely sure about that. And we now also have evidence for dark matter in clusters of galaxies, uh, because if you study the rate of motion of the galaxies, the galaxy cluster should be evaporating, unless there's a lot more gravity around, unless there's a lot more dark material around. And uh, this is rather an old slide now, but I still rather love it. Um, a lensed image. Um, the orange things are relatively foreground galaxies. You can probably see in a large ring around the central elliptical blob, triple blob, you can see some bluish uh, extended things forming basically a circle right round. And that's the lensed image of a quasar way beyond that central group of galaxies. And the uh, width of the, the ring implies how much gravitation there is associated with that galaxy group in the middle. And there's a lot more than the stuff you see, a lot, lot more, hence dark matter. For a slight change of tack, um, one of my hobbies is collecting poetry with an astronomical theme. And I sometimes do talks on astronomy and poetry, and if ever you want to get women into the lecture theatre, that's the way to do it. It would be nice if there were more direct ways of getting women interested in physics, but we're still trying. Uh, Rebecca Elson didn't live very long. She died of cancer at a relatively young age. Um, she spent quite a bit of time uh, both in Canada and in the UK and various other places. And she was interested in the evolution of stars. But she also published quite a lot of poetry. And just for a change of topic, I'll read you one of her poems. Um, it's about searching for dark matter, which is why it's in this bit of the talk. For this we go out dark nights, searching for the dimmest stars for signs of unseen things to weigh us down, to stop the universe from rushing on and on into its own beyond, till it exhausts itself and lies down cold, its last star going out. Whatever they turn out to be, let there be swarms of them, enough for immortality, always a star where we can warm ourselves. Let there be enough to bring it back from its own edges, to bring us all so close that we ignite the bright spark of resurrection. So, turning now rather more generally to women in astronomy, in astrophysics, um, and by today I mean recent years, not just necessarily today. And a relevant story starts in Denmark, where there's a couple who are astronomers, Johannes Andersen and his wife, Birgitta. Johannes has a nice job. I think it was in Copenhagen. I can't quite remember. Birgitta has huge difficulty getting an astronomy job in Denmark. And she does things like she has a university admin job for 80% of her time and does 20% astronomy unpaid in the rest, this kind of thing. And Johannes is really troubled by this. He does not think Birgitta is stupid. He thinks that she, she, he's prob she is probably a better astronomer than he is, a better scientist. And Neither of them are quite clear what's going on, but they suspect a gender issue. And then Johannes realizes he has some data which could put their experience in context. He is the general secretary of the International Astronomical Union, the IAU. And as well as countries through their major astronomy society, being members of the IAU, the IAU also has individual membership. And Johannes starts recording 
the individual membership by country and by gender. Only two genders, I have to say, which today we probably wouldn't be so limited, but nevertheless it's formed an interesting database and I have been tracking this. Unfortunately, if you go looking at the IAU database, you only see the recent years. So this data may be the only information we have about the database and how it stood in some earlier years. So 2005, I restrict myself to countries that have at least 200 people in membership of the IAU so that the root N errors are not too large. And then I list those countries in decreasing order of the fraction of their membership that is female. So back in 2005, Argentina was far and away the most woman-friendly country, apparently, with a third of its astronomers female. And surprise, surprise, Japan was the least female-friendly. And the others in between are ranked. The IAU average at that point was 13% female, which is not terribly good, but that's what it was. Um, Argentina and Brazil are quite high up. Italy, Spain quite high up. And this has been quite a consistent pattern. Uh, Southern American and Southern European countries tend to be better for women, at least in astronomy, than other countries. It's and similar. the English, yeah? It's similar in physics. Yeah, but it's much, much lower. Um, and there isn't actually the data in physics, to the best of my knowledge, because IUPAP doesn't have the same membership arrangements. Yeah, physics is worse than astronomy, as we probably in this room all know. Um, English-speaking countries are not fantastic. Um, USA has a significant fraction of the membership. I forget the fraction, it's, I don't know, 30% or something. And it's quite an achievement to be below the average. <laughs> I don't need to finish the sentence, yep. Um, English-speaking countries don't seem to do at all well. Japan, you can understand. Um, pick one of those countries that you want to track. It'll probably occur in some more slides. I've forgotten to date this one. It'll be a year or two later. The IAU average is 12%. Oh, it must be very much about the same time. Um, Southern Europe, Southern America. Uh, Russia is consistently high, but I think that's their history. They lost a large number of men in world wars, and in Russia the women have had to work. So the state has provided lots and lots of nurseries for childcare, and there's much more a tradition of women working than in some other countries. Denmark's not particularly good, is it, at 12%? But it's only a little bit below the world average. Uh, again, I've forgotten to date this one, but it's slightly later still. You can see the world average gradually creeping up. Um, what other things have changed in that one? Australia has now reached the uh, world average. This is so far the best of the English-speaking countries. English-speaking countries are not covering themselves in glory. You see Canada, USA, UK, all in a little bunch. India, if you call it English-speaking, a lot, lot lower. Japan, yeah. Twenty eighteen. I think I've now jumped to countries with more than 200 members, which is why there's, it's a smaller table overall. Um, however, but the world average is now 17%, and there's one, two, three, four, five of those countries above it. Yippee. 
uh, India and Japan, much the same place. Keep an eye on the Netherlands. It gets quite interesting. USA, UK, well below, and Canada, well below the world average. What are we playing at in these countries? 2020, Netherlands has gone up to 19%. UK has gone down quite a bit. Japan's still the bottom. Southern European countries, South American countries doing quite nicely. You maybe wouldn't expect huge change in that kind of social pattern, but it seems to be there quite consistently. And the most recent one, 2023. Oh, I've lost the world average. Um, it's 20 something percent. Sorry, I must improve that slide. Uh, Japan, right down the bottom. UK, close to Japan. Germany, yeah, all right. China's a little surprising. Canada, USA. Netherlands. Netherlands had a period where they were allowed to recruit women only. Um, you know, the law was set aside briefly. And that, I believe, talking to some Dutch people, is why at one point they surged quite well up the table. But what's going on in the UK? Well, this reveals another unfortunate aspect of this data because it's not nearly as robust as you might think it is. The way people get made members of the IAU is if their national astronomical body forwards their name to the IAU. In Britain, it's the Royal Astronomical Society. They had a change of chief executive, and they forgot to put this job amongst the list of jobs the chief executive had to do. So for a good many years, the IAU has not been given any more members, male or female, from the UK. And that's probably one of the reasons we've rather catastrophically slipped down this table. So, you know, this is not physics. It's not as rigid data as you're probably used to as physicists. But I think it has some interest, at least. Now, apart from the reliability of the data, probably younger people in the room are well aware that dividing people into male or female, period, is a bit limiting, crude, that maybe something a little bit more nuanced would be fairer. So the IAU has taken this on board, and a few weeks ago, offered a much greater swathe of options. This means I can't do this analysis anymore, <laughs> but never mind. Um, I did this talk recently to an audience with a lot of students in it, and I thought, good, the students are going to help me understand what male plus is, and female neutral, and things like that. Um, that was in this country. The students did not understand, did not what, know what the definitions of a number of those things are. So what's going to happen next with this database, I honestly don't know. Um, obviously male and female, just male and female is far too crude. Um, but to produce a whole lot of terms that you don't define is maybe not helpful either. Choose your, you know, it leaves, gives you some fair choice. Um, I'd also like to say just a little bit about some other gender issues in the UK, because along with tracking the data, um, people like me are perpetually asking, why are there so few women in physics? There are slightly more in astronomy, but why aren't there more in astrophysics? Why are the women scientists that there are in biology? and not in physics, and not in engineering. Uh, a group that I have a certain amount of time for has done an analysis of the words used in advertisements for boys' toys and girls' toys. 
Do you need telling which is which? It's pretty shocking. And that's one of the reasons why this organization, Let Toys Be Toys, is publishing this kind of stuff. Certainly in Britain, we are conditioning our kids very, very early to be real little girls or real little boys with rather crude characterization. And science doesn't really fit in the right-hand one, does it? Or is it fits okay in the left-hand one? So that's depressing. But in Britain, there's been some interesting developments, which I'll run through fairly quickly because this ain't Britain. And although maybe other countries can learn some lessons about what we've done, maybe you can't. Uh, certainly, I started out myself believing that the battles had been fought and gradually discovered that the battles had not been fought. Um, and this is probably why you find more older women than younger women are feminists and, you know, do irritated talks like this. <laughs> In universities, particularly these days, data is collected. How many women, how many men are there at each level? And surprise, surprise, it shows as you go up the ranks. The fraction that's female gets smaller and smaller. It also shows that women progress more slowly than the men. The, the rate of advancement is slower. And that's an interesting observation. But in Britain, it also showed that will, women were less willing to put in applications for jobs, for fellowships, sometimes even grants for telescope time. The women were much, much more cautious. So, having identified this, somebody said, right, we must fix the women. We must make the women more like the men, basically. Make the women braver, more willing to put in grant applications, apply for jobs, apply for promotion, and that kind of thing. And they set up special training sources, courses to help the women be braver. But... The flaw there is it assumes the problem is with the women and the way the rest of scientific or academic society operates. That's perfectly okay, folks. No problems there. It's the women. So we need to fix the women. Um, somebody pointed that out to the organizers, so they changed their tune. Okay, we need special funding for women, particularly women who've had time out to have babies. You know, returner fellowships to help them coming back. Um, and maybe other things open to women only, just to, you know, help them be as good as the men. And that operated for a few years, and then we discovered there were some charming gentlemen who would say, you only got that because you're a woman. You're not good enough. You should resign. It was really said. And so they thought, ah, maybe that's not quite right. So uh, they opened up that type of funding to both men and women. So in Britain, if men take paternity leave to help look after a new baby, they are entitled to some funding for that. It's not just all left to the women. But slowly people began to realize that helping the women would help some individual women, but actually wasn't going to change the way things functioned, um, or was very unlikely to. And they began to look for what they called institutional change, the way organizations operate. Is it making implicit assumptions that the male career pattern is the norm, for instance? Or are there other implicit assumptions? So whilst individuals might be absolutely fair, the structures might not be. Uh, biases in recruitment or retention. Uh, women often have different management styles. I don't know if you've experienced many women as, as bosses, but they, they often do. And it used to be considered that women's styles were inferior. It was the male one that was right, of course. But gradually they came to recognize that 
um, maybe a variety of management styles was quite okay. And then there's also what we call unconscious bias. And I think a lot of us suffer from this unless we're very careful. You'd have seen something like the bottom line, application forms, reading application forms. Any comments on that? M first. Hey, M first, you are well on the ball. No British audience twigs that. <laughs> Why does M come before F? What alphabet is that? <laughs> yeah. This is what we call unconscious bias. And that's what the IAU has been doing all the years it's been collecting data about the gender of astronomers. And so of many, many other organizations, probably almost any form you have to fill in. It took me a long time to twig this. Now that I've twigged it, I have great fun, and you can too. Some organization sends you a long, tedious form to fill out. Go look to the question about gender or sex. Um, it might only have two. These days it often has more than two options. But are they in alphabetical order? They are probably not. Send a message back to the organizers. I'm very sympathetic with what you're trying to do, but your, for, your questionnaire is showing unconscious bias, and I regret because of that I cannot complete it. Wait a couple of days. Back comes an email. We're very keen to be absolutely fair. We're so sorry you see some sort of bias in our form. We've looked very carefully at it. We can't see it. Could you tell us, please? <laughs> well, you've got to do what you can to set the world to rights, haven't you? <laughs> and these days, of course, it would be far more than just male or female. And exactly what terms they use is, is interesting. Um, things are changing quite fast. Too fast for some of the older folk, I think. Um, we've seen certainly in this country, maybe less so in Britain, exposure of some serial harassers, people being removed from the academy, being used for jobs. Um, I'm glad to see there is this attention. I'm scared there might be a pushback. I'd be interested in your comments on that. And my conclusions that for women, well, it does help to have a good sense of humor uh, because there's times you can't do much else but laugh at how crass it is. But it does cost. Um, I've told quite a lot of stories. I think stories are very powerful. So if you know some good stories illustrating points you want to make, tell them. I think it's crucial to make sure there's good management. And certainly in Britain, quite a lot of it is still heavy masculine. And it's also important to, particularly in physics, don't expect the women to be we men. You know, physicists with slightly different anatomy, so to speak. Um, affirm women as women and allow them to be women and contribute as women because that diversity will strengthen your place no end. We do need more scientists and engineers. Uh, we're failing to make use of 50% of the population or at least adequately make use of our females. Uh, I know that girls can do physics brilliantly. I know saying that would probably surprise quite a lot of girls, maybe even surprise some of the teachers, I regret. We found in the UK that in single sex educational environments, girls are more likely to do science than in co-educational environments. And I believe the IAU data shows that it's culture, not women's brains, that's determining these figures. And so, having thrown out a fair number of controversial things, I'll stop. 
and run for cover if need be. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, or comments, or brickbats. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And what we really find is it's the climate that, yes. yeah. that women are not willing to put up with a negative climate for mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. whereas the male students don't seem to notice mm -hmm. as much yeah. what the climate is in the department. Yeah. So part of what you say about the, the conditions at the place rather than the women mm -hmm. is really shown up yeah. in, in those visits and those studies. Yes. And yeah. Being found. Yeah. We've had similar programs in the UK, um, groups visiting by invitation to kind of sense the climate in the department. We make recommendations whether departments respond to them or not, we never know. No. <laughs> mm. So Justin, I was sort of struck in the statistics that you showed mm. that there may be a small silver lining which we may or may not adopt, and that is that with the world average going up in yes. fraction, it wasn't actually the best getting better, it was the worst improving someone. It's the bottom mm -hmm. half got higher. And mm -hmm. you know, that's yeah. not an absolute good, but it is a relative good. Yeah. And I wonder would it have happened if the data were not public? Yeah. No, we, you can't know, but mm. yes. That's a fair point. Thank you. Um, thanks for the nice talk. I have a comment about all this uh, uh, data. So if I understood correctly, the data comes from, um, let's say, each country astronomical union. Yeah. Okay. So I think it would be interesting to, I know it's much more complicated to, to study, but uh, to see the country of origin of people in the given country, because mm -hmm. I'm from Italy and Italy was doing really great, yes. 35%, 28%, yeah. but I am working here. Okay. So, yes. Um, and under IAU regulations, you count as American. It's where you work that goes into that data. It's where I work. Huh? It's where you work. Okay, not the country of origin. No. I see. Mm. So you're boosting the USA. Yes, yeah, so that's why I'm saying I'm proud that Italy is uh, number one in 2023, 2020, but I'm contributing uh, to the 12% of the US mm. that we have seen. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you're reasonably confident about going to astronomy classes, physics classes, see if you can bring some other women with you, at least early in the year, you know, before they've finally settled on what courses they're doing. Be careful which professor's classes you select, but... Um, <laughs> but yes. Uh, and even later in the year, if you can talk enthusiastically back in the dorm about how things are going or what you're doing and
got in touch with the creativity again and again, um, up to the point of leadership several times. Mm. It's just very interesting to me, um, and I'm curious what your mindset was mm. behind these things, or getting back in touch with the positive aspects of these things. I attended an old girls school, a girls boarding school, which had trouble getting science teachers. Our chemistry teacher told us the periodic table, the listing was just, you know, how God made it. Don't think he knew about electronic structure. <laughs> Our physics teacher was brilliant, fortunately. Um, at university, undergraduate, I was the only female in a class of 50. And that was really tough because it was the tradition at that time in Glasgow that when a woman entered the lecture hall, all the guys whistled, stamped, cat called, banged the desks. And these are wooden lecture theatres. Um, doing a PhD, well, I had, I had identified as a teenager that I wanted to be an astronomer. Minor glitch when somebody pointed out, you're working at night, and I like my sleep. And then I discovered you do astronomy at other wavelengths like radio, so I was focused on radio <laughs> astronomy. Um, so, yeah, did a physics degree because I thought that would be the best preparation, but I was the only female in this class. I worked one summer at Jodrell Bank, the Radio Astronomy Observatory in Britain, and that was really good and really helpful. Uh, I applied to do a PhD there, and they didn't reply. And I had been told by other grad students when I was there that they'd never take a woman. Um, because at one point, a female student and a male student put the dormitory to a use for which it wasn't intended. Sir Bernard Lovell got to hear about it and said, no more women. Interesting which gender bears the brunt of these mutual encounters. Um, so, Jodrell didn't reply. I decided they weren't going to take me. I thought I was going to Australia. Didn't think I'd get into Cambridge. Um, the year in Australia doesn't begin till January, February. At a few months in hand, I put an application into Cambridge just in case and got there. I was absolutely terrified when I got there. It was full of young men who'd been at expensive schools. Now, how aware were you of Boris Johnson, our Prime Minister? You've heard of him. You've heard of him. Well, it was full of, can you imagine Boris at student age? <laughs> it was full of them. <laughs> uh, and as a woman, you could not wear trousers to a lecture theatre, to a lecture. You had to wear a gown and it had to be over a skirt or dress. As a student building a radio telescope out at the observatory, you couldn't wear a dress. You had to wear trousers. <laughs> so there's things like this that niggle at you. Um, and I got engaged to be married um, between discovering pulsars two and three, I think it was. Uh, got married fairly soon afterwards and started a period of my life where a husband would say, there's a job for me going in such and such a place. If I move there, I'd get promotion. If I go there, is there anything astronomical anywhere near there for you? And if there was, he'd apply. If there wasn't, he didn't. And so I went from radio astronomy to gamma ray astronomy, from gamma to X, from X to infrared, and then millimeter. And then the marriage broke up. <laughs> And then I'm free to go for a job because of what it is, not where it is. And I became professor of physics in a university, a rather unusual university. Um, my career has been heavily determined by the fact that I'm female and of the age that I am. I think it's quite a bit better for younger women, but I'm sure a number of those issues are still very much around. Yeah. And you also mentioned a couple of times in your talk that there's a discrepancy between the number of women in astrophysics versus other types of physics. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious what you think, when the average young woman makes that decision and what sort of accounts for that discrepancy? Well, if you're feeling a bit isolated in your physics class and you can see that there are several women dons in that patch of physics, 
you're maybe going to gravitate a bit towards that patch of physics, maybe subconsciously. I don't know. I think I was unusual in knowing before I went to university that I wanted to be an astronomer. I also found geology very interesting. I did a year of geology, came top of the class without trying. Thought, ah, this is a lot easier than physics. <laughs> Went to see the head of geology, the professor. And he said, no, not for women. At that time, this is my rationalization of his decision. At that time, the geologists were mainly employed searching for oil in the Burmese jungle. There are no ladies' toilets in the Burmese jungle, so women can't be geologists. <laughs> Think of another reason. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I, I was fortunate in that I had a fairly clear idea of what I wanted to do, and I had parents that supported me. Um, and a hell of a lot of stubbornness. <laughs> Yes, things where they say only women can. Um, it's legal in Britain in some situations temporarily to try and improve a gender balance. But experience suggests there's often some charming gentlemen who say you only got that because you're female. And that's not very helpful. Um, what has really worked in Britain is what is called Athena Swan, um, and there's a bit of history which I won't go into, but we'll be here till tomorrow. Um, an award scheme that recognizes places that have reasonable numbers of women in them. Uh, and that worked, and heads of universities took an interest in it when the research funding bodies said, you must hold an Athena Swan award before you can apply for dot, dot, dot. Um, that was incredibly powerful. It almost overwhelmed us at Athena Swan with suddenly all these applications piling in, but um, it certainly made a difference. I think it's the funding bodies and maybe the academies that have the power to make change. And it actually shouldn't be up to women, but it is very much still up to women to say that questionnaire is biased because I don't think anybody else is going to notice, <laughs> or hardly anybody else. Thank you. Any, any other questions or comments? Yes. Uh, OK, you're very close together. I don't care who goes first. Just a brief question, uh, because it does match my experience uh, in South America, that uh, it seemed to me like the gender balance if we just go by male and female yeah. of the of the classes and even the faculty yeah. tended to be a little bit better, if not sometimes a lot better than <laughs> what I saw when I got here to the US. Yes. Um, uh -huh. So I'm curious, uh, do, do you have any sense of why maybe like, you know, South America or Southern Europe tended to be scoring better as well, like yeah. in, the, in the gender balance and the I don't know the history of those countries well enough. Um, I know in Britain that a substantial factor, as I think I've already said, is that post-World War II they got the women back into domestic roles to free up jobs for the returning soldiers. And that kind of attitude carried on. So it may be some quirk in South American histories that has changed it. Yeah, who knows? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> an Italian physicist, I think my mask up so you can hear me. An Italian physicist told me, well, a male Italian physicist said, that, and Italy is the highest percentage of women PhDs in, in physics. Yeah. Uh, said, well, it's because physics isn't the high status career in Italy. Yes, because there's so many women in it, yes. <laughs> South America, too. Uh-huh. Yeah. So it could be the answer. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Um, to, to, to 
change tracks just a little bit. Mm -hmm. You said that you were, sorry, Siri's also trying to help. Um, that, that there was, you were worried a little bit about pushback yeah. on some of the changes. Yes. And I, you know, you look at American politics and you can, <laughs> Maybe I'll just go way out on the limb, right? You, you can, I mean, I worry that a lot of the very reactionary politics in the U.S. are, in fact, you know, reactions of old white men getting very scared about women and black and mm -hmm. other yeah. folks you yeah. know, finally Could be. getting some, yeah. some power here. And, mm -hmm. and what has emerged from that are folks mm. like Trump yeah. Things like abortion, and it's just, yeah. it's terrifying. Yeah. I wonder if you have any advice, any comments, anything to say about that? I think it's a huge social problem in the United States. That's so we really need to teach men and women how to live together fairly? Is that basically what you're saying? I, I wonder what you have to say. I mean, it's, you know, I, yeah. I worry. Yeah. I, I, can, I can see the effect of the social engineering that went on in Britain post-war. So I think social engineering is a lot to do with this. So maybe we need to make sure the social engineering in our own country is not having unfortunate side effects. Now, who does the social engineering? <laughs> the National Academies should be doing a bit of it. Um, leading newspaper journalists, TV, web journalists should be doing a bit of it. Probably need to create a prize that'll draw attention. Yeah. Well, I should mention the Trump conviction today yeah. might help a bit. <laughs> yeah. Might help a bit. <laughs> yeah. Should help a bit. Mm. But well, I, I don't see any other hands and perhaps since it's getting a little bit like, I really want to thank you for thank you. a thought-provoking, even kind of inspiring mm -hmm. talk, not the usual physics colloquium, <laughs> and one that I think we're, we're all, all very, very happy we were able to attend. Thank so you. Thanks very much. Let's, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.